Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. And as we look to open the word of the Lord, shall we seek his guidance and his blessing as we look to apply these words and these examples into our lives and into this movement? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you today, we thank you for the many blessings of the week that is now past, but we thank you most of all for the blessing of this Sabbath. As we enter in and enjoy the Sabbath rest, Father, please guide us. Help us so that as we open the words of this prophet, and discuss the words of your prophet. May we understand more that we need to know for this time in this earth's history. I thank you, Father, for those that are joining in this meeting. Please direct us now and guide us so that that which is done and that which we discuss will bring glory to your name and help us to understand that which it means for us to properly represent you at this time in earth's history for this father we thank you and we praise you in jesus name amen okay making one little modification Okay, now, we have been going through the book of Zephaniah. <clears throat> As we started this last week, we have an exhortation to repentance. Then we are seeing the judgment upon the Philistines, upon Moab and Ammon, on Ethiopia and Assyria. So in this situation, this prophet is presenting for our time the fact that we need to understand repentance. And then there are symbols of the judgments that are going to come on the nations around Israel and the nations that have in the case of Assyria, Moab, Ammon, and the Philistines attacked Israel. It's interesting that we are also presented with Ethiopia. So, as we look at this, Zephaniah is given a message. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation, not desirous. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Is, <clears throat> is this portion giving us a warning before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, and before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, is this also not a doubling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would we look at this as being the fierce anger of the Lord and the day of the Lord's anger? Would that not be the Sunday law or would that be after the Sunday law? How should we how should we apply this? Well, I mean it's connected to the Sunday law, but it's not the Sunday law itself. Then what is the decree? Well, so it says, well, before the decree bring forth before the day pass, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Um I think part of it is understanding 
the context of this word before. Okay. Because <clears throat> this is a warning that comes before. So I would think the decree bringing forth can be the Sunday law. But these things are all connected to the Sunday law. Okay. So the context here is gather yourselves together before this happens. And so it lists a series of events connected to the Sunday law. Because that's what we are to warn people about. And this gather together. Um, is is often used in gathering together stubble so I, I don't know if this is what 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 this what they're supposed to gather themselves together for isn't what could we also not look at stubble as being a type of a remnant it could I mean, the word, the primitive root means to become sapless through drought. Isn't uh, that what we are seeing has happened within the church? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, why are they gathering themselves together? <clears throat> um, right. I, you know, I'm not sure exactly what this means. In the, in the context, you could look at it two different ways, like gather yourselves together you know, in a, in a positive way, but it seems like he's saying gather yourselves together at, almost as a type of, of sarcasm that he's going to bring these judgments upon them. And, and they're really just, um, in a sense, they're gathering together against God. So this is, this is about the church in their attempts to um, however you put it, you know, to be godly, but without following God, right? So this is, but but this is then going to be about God's enemies or the, the enemies of, of the church. So I, I don't really know how to understand this. I'm not sure what the gathering themselves together is about. I, I looked this up and tried to figure it out, but I, I haven't come to a conclusion. Well, <clears throat> as we have been looking in other studies, have we not seen that the church has chosen to join more with the world, mm -hmm. especially in its method of study and in the way in which they choose yeah because this word gather, oh sorry go, go ahead please well it's just this word is also in exodus 5 7 ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore let them go and gather straw for themselves and, and it's also mentioned later to gather stubble instead of straw um and then uh, the gathering of sticks that happened um, on, on the Sabbath. The guy who ends up being stoned. And then um, in First Kings, it talks about gathering sticks. That's the woman of uh, Zarephath. Right. And, and uh, that's, and then also, yeah. So those are those are the examples of gathered. So so to me, this gathering yourselves together is is a different types of gathering than we see in other places. Because there are other times it talks about gathering, but that's a different word completely. This one is is more for straw or sticks. In the one case to, to build bricks, the other uh, you know sticks to start a fire. So if we're, if we're looking at this, in the gathering of the straw for the bricks, uh -huh. what are the bricks to be used for? Well, to build tombs, I would think, or, or some kind of things for the, 
maybe houses. It's hard to say what the bricks were used for. And the straw is used something to strengthen the bricks. Yeah. So <clears throat> in this situation, is this being used to build a like a false temple to God? Is that not something that the enemies would do? Yeah, it's hard to say. I just don't. Uh, I'm not sure if I quite understand this chapter yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to take some time because we need to understand this before we go on to the next chapter. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Just that gather yourself together. Gather yourself together, O niche, not the Zareth. Uh, would that not be like the remnant coming together? Because obviously the world doesn't desire the remnant. So could it be taken in that context that those that are outcasts are coming together in the faith because of the way the world's opposed against them? Like the two sticks, something. Well, I think that I think what we're all looking at right now <clears throat> is this the remnant, or is this the portion that God does not desire? Yeah, I think it's God does not desire them. So this is the church that's being rejected. And that's why I think it's the gathering yourselves together is a type of, it's a type of mocking. Because when, when we go back into how this was presented with the translators, we see the exhortation to repentance as we, as we go into the next verse. God is calling all to repentance including those that are choosing not to accept his law and his, his dominion over them. <clears throat> and then we have the Philistines, Moab, Ammon, Ethiopia, and Assyria. Yeah, Cush, but which they have is Ethiopia. But what we, what we have here is in a way of looking at it, the antithesis of the five wise virgins. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot to consider in here. Now, when we're told, gather yourselves together, Joel 2.16, we are told, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom come go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. <clears throat> the book of Joel is one that created quite a division within the movement because you had what Elder Jeff was presenting, and then you had what others had chosen pr to present in making use of old Protestant commentaries. So we wound up with a, an example of why we should be using Miller's rules. Yeah. Now here, of course, the gather is not the same word at all. Okay. Right. So. So what we're looking at is two different types of gathering. Mm -hmm. Is that also a representation of two different types of banners? Mm hmm. So as we, as we look further in here, 
before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, and we're given Job 21.18. They are as stubble before the wind and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. <clears throat> Is that the situation we wish to find ourselves in? Do we wish to be carried away by the wind? You could say wind of doctrine or, or whatever. Right. Psalm 1 verse 4. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. And then we have Isaiah 17, 13. The nation shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them. And they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And then Hosea 13.3, therefore they shall be as the morning cloud and as the early dew that passes away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor and as the smoke out of the chimney. The analogy with the smoke out of the chimney I think is very poignant because how much are we seeing as a remnant with smoke? It's something that's destroyed. It's something that is burned up. And when we were comparing this as the chaff before the fierce anger of the Lord, the translators came back using 2 Kings 23, 26. Notwithstanding the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. Manasseh was not in the good kings list, yet we have what is said to be the prayer of Manasseh within the Apocrypha. So as this section concludes, we are given this exhortation, seek ye the Lord all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness, it may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So at the beginning, we have this exhortation. Now we're given a close of the exhortation, and we need to examine this as to how it applies to us today. So we're told to seek ye the Lord. Psalm 105, 4. Seek the Lord and his strength and his face evermore. And then in Amos 5, 6. Seek the Lord and ye shall live, lest he break out like the fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. As we continue to look at this, all ye meek of the earth, and we're given a definition from Psalm 76, 9. When God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth, those at the end of earth's history will be seen as being the meek. 
they will represent the character of Christ. In this situation, do we see the proud, the vain, the haughty? Do we see them as being of the meek? Are they representing Christ? No, no, I don't see him. Right. Now, seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So, yeah. um, okay, just a, a point here. Please. So, there's actually a contrast being made here between those that gather themselves together and those that seek the Lord. And and in Hebrew, there's actually a little play on words. Okay. Uh, the word bakash is the word that seek. All right. The word that's gather is kashash. Um, so they're kind of playing on that word kash uh, with the bakash. Right, so it's it's a contrast of these two things. There's one that gathers themselves together, basically to be consumed by the Lord's anger, and another one that's seeking the Lord. And and that word seek um, uh, means to find or secure or desire, and also um, so you have this people that's not desired which is Casal. So, um, so anyway, there's this, this contrast between these two, Greek, two groups. So in this contrast between the two groups, what we are seeing is, is those that are assembling under the two banners. Mm-hmm. This, the two classes. The two classes. So, so one, one's going to be hit in the days of hit in the day of the Lord's anger. The other one's going to have uh, the Lord's anger come upon them. One is going to be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. The other is going to be fully revealed in the Lord in the day of the Lord's anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Character, the character that everybody put on. Right. Is it not the character that they have chosen to accept that is then being revealed? Yes. So in this situation, is this not giving us a, a further example of what we would have to apply from Revelation 14 in the third angel's message. Because is this the, yep. the day of the Lord's anger? Is that not the hour of his judgment? Yep, yep. So if we are comparing this with the book of Daniel, are we able to see elements from this verse that we would also find within Daniel 11? Because the situation is that by Daniel 12, Christ has stood up. Those that have been hid with him 
have passed through the judgment in front of the mercy seat. Those that are not hid with him are the ones that find themselves being led to destruction. Mm -hmm. So as we look at this that the, the translators had used, we have Joel 2.14 followed by points from Amos and Jonah. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Even a meal offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Why was, why was the meat and the drink offering so important? I mean, the meat that they're talking about here, was it, I mean, we're, we're not talking about flesh, we're talking about something else entirely, right? You have your you have your screen up. Wouldn't be symbolic if it wasn't. It's a screen. You got the screen up. Well, I've had my the screen up on this part of Zephaniah. Yes. Oh, I don't see it. Okay. Anybody else having that problem? No. No. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. It appears the symbology is there. There's quite a bit of symbology here. No, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that uh, it, it, from what you're saying and to what I see is symbolic, uh, I would have to say yes. Okay. <clears throat> now from the book of Amos. Hate the evil and love the good and establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Symbolically, what is the remnant of Joseph? And Manasseh um, and Ephraim. Right. Today, what would be considered as the remnant of Joseph? Well, this would be Protestants. Okay. People who come out of the Protestant churches. All right. I agree. Now we have Jonah 3 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? and turn away from his fierce anger, that we perish not. We're receiving quite, quite a number of word pictures. We're receiving quite a number of symbols. And throughout this book, we're going to have to puzzle out the symbols that we are seeing so that we can place them in proper perspective for our time today. Okay. Um, one of the things that I noticed earlier on while we were uh, studying the main body, speaking of wind, and wind, from what I am remember, is doctrine, whether it's good or whether it's evil. Right. Um, I don't know what smoke is. That's a, that's that's that was something that I haven't really had an understanding for, um, and neither did the Millerites, from what I can see, or at least Miller. Right. What's the Hebrew word that was used for smoke? Um, what? 
Okay, which verse is that exactly? Okay. Um, so I can't remember. I know we looked at it, but. Okay, just a moment. Oh, Hosea 13.3. Right. Um, vapor, dust, it also refers figuratively to anger. Ashan. I've always seen it in relationship with um fire and heat like like somebody's getting hot they're smoking yeah. well it is in genesis 15 17 uh when it talks about a smoking furnace right right does it have application with the the furnace of nebuchadnezzar well they don't really mention smoke there. Okay. It is in Joel 2.30. Uh, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Now that's an interesting um, analogy. A pillar of smoke. Yeah. Where do we find that? <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, well, a pillar of a pillar is usually meant to support something. Um, right. But, you know, made out of smoke, it's not really going to do much. So in this situation, we're given the exhortation that we need to be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. If we are not so hidden, do we not experience the outpouring of his wrath? Yes, and we need to be hidden in him, right? Right. Yeah, the thing that I keep seeing um, as I read all these verses together um, I see like the, uh, the church um, having troubles and the one that the, the, I keep seeing all the, all the members uh, happening like they were at um, the temple being slaughtered by the Romans. Um, good, bad, indifferent, it didn't really matter. Uh, but if they weren't hidden, they were going to be destroyed. And I see that, you know, the hidden in Christ where you wouldn't be destroyed, but I, I just can't, I don't know what that means, not physically or spiritually. I think it's spiritual because it's, it's uh, symbolic. Right. <clears throat> Okay, now this, these three verses taken together are a thought from this in Zephaniah. Now, as we go on to the fourth verse, we begin a new thought. For Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday and Ekron shall be rooted up. <clears throat> Are these not four of the five cities of the Philistines? Yeah. Yes. So, what are the Philistines representing here? And why these four and not the fifth? What was the fifth one? Just a minute. See if I can come up with that quickly. Mm -hmm. oh. 
I could probably do it, but. Okay, five cities of the Philistines. Oh, we shouldn't have forgotten the fifth one. We have Ascalon, Ashdod, Gaza, Ekron, and Gath. Oh, right. So it's interesting that Gath is not included in this list. So Gaza being forsaken. We're given examples here, quite a few of them actually. We begin in the book of Jeremiah. Because of the day that cometh to spoil the Philistines and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon, every helper that remaineth, for the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Caphthor. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ascalon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long wilt thou cut thyself? What cut kind of, thyself? That kind of goes back to what we were studying not too long ago. Um, why they were cutting themselves, right, and presenting themselves to the Lord. Uh, why would you cut yourself? Wasn't I mean, if if we look at this from the time of Elijah, didn't the priests of Baal? cut themselves yes. in their method of worship yes yes it was quite uh, pronounced now we have ezekiel twenty five fifteen. thus saith the lord god because the philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a dis despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred now this portion of Ezekiel, is that not part of his third vision? Yeah. And when we went through this with Ezekiel, what was the reason, the, the direction of that third vision? Well, it was um, after uh, the siege. Well, I mean, it's connected with the siege, and he's going to just give judgments against these different groups, um, Edom, Moab, Ammon, and Philistia, are, are, the, are the ones that are mentioned in chapter five, 25. Okay. And then he's going to have judgments against Egypt and gut judgments against Tyre. So we looked at that as the, the three parts of Babylon, the the – the ones in chapter 25 representing the false prophet, the United States, um, and then, of course, Egypt being the dragon power, the globalists, and uh, Tyre representing the papacy. Okay. Symbolically, what is, what is meant by dealt with by revenge? Here are the Philistines. We're applying the Philistines as being analogous to the false prophet. Mm -hmm. If we use this analogy, what is meant by, the, by this phrase, because the Philistines have dealt by revenge? Okay, you said... We had representation of the Philistines as what? False prophet. Uh, yeah, Edom, Moab, Ammon, and Philistia. So those are all going to be representing Protestantism in some form or other. 
but I, I don't know what, what what you see there in that question. Okay. We're being shown here that the Philistines have dealt by revenge and have taken vengeance with a despiteful heart to destroy it for the old hatred. What were they looking in, in this verse? What's the reference of what the Philistines want to destroy? Would they not be looking to destroy a different method of biblical interpretation, such as Miller's rules? Would they not be looking to despise this because it does not fit with the ideas of the need for accepting the Greek method of understanding and learning. Well, isn't that the controversy that we're having with the church now? I would say it's a good part of it. I mean, they want to they wanna use the Protestant way and we want to use Millerite's way. And right. they seem to think that the Millerite's way is evil and destructive. I mean, there's something going on here. Sure. There's quite a bit that's going on here. Well, this old hatred, it, which is could be perpetual hatred, but um, I mean, this is the hatred that goes back, the enmity that goes back between that that the serpent has with the woman. That's that right. Between them. That's right. And, and um, so they're going to, but we also can look at this idea as being. Uh, you know, if you look at it as perpetual, it's the word olam, which we often means eternity, right? Um, we have this hatred that has been carried on against God's word, which the Protestants, the Protestant Reformation, they were, you know, they were upholding God's word, but the Protestants fall, and and they get that old hatred, that hate, same hatred. It comes from the serpent that was given to the papacy. Now we see the Protestant churches have that same hatred towards God's word. It was somewhat inherited. Yeah. So, so, this, re, so this revenge would be the revenge of Satan for being cast out of heaven and because of his jealousy. Ultimately. The connections are all there. I mean, they're they're all there. And if you have a time to think and remember these things, and that's why it tells us to remember. Remember the rest. I, I oftentimes take that to mean have a dual meaning: the rest being the Sabbath rest, and the rest is everything else. Right. As we proceed, we look at Amos 1, verses 6 through 8. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they carried away captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza which shall devour the palaces thereof. And I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon. And I will turn mine hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistine shall perish, saith the Lord God. Yeah, there it says uh, three three transgressions of Gaza, and for the fourth, I was thinking of four generations. You know, agreed. Correlate, somehow correlates with that. 
I agree. That Definitely that 3-1 combination. Definitely. So we have both in play within this verse. Gaza was one of the cities that Judah had captured. Yet the Philistines later claimed it as one of theirs. This is part of the territory where the children of Israel did not fully accept the word of God. They did not fully come to an understanding of righteousness by faith because they chose to let the Canaanites live among them. So we're given this and we're being shown. We have this 3-1 combination, these four generations. And what's being presented is the destruction that's going to come upon those that do not have the full faith in God. That do not take him at his word. So is this not giving us a warning today that we need to accept him at his word, at his whole word, his total word, by doing exactly what we're doing in comparing line upon line, to look at the scripture as a complete instruction to us? Now, when we come down to Zechariah, verses 9, 5, and 9, 6, Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for her expectation shall be ashamed. And the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. And a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. What's the pride of the Protestant nations today? What's the pride within the church today? I thought for just a moment that it might be the once save, always save. For the Protestants, I mean, because that's their mantra. Okay. And that's exactly the, the reason why they don't accept the, um, well, it's not once saved, always saved. It's, you know, you, that's conditional. It's always conditional. But I don't know if that's it. Just Are guess. they also not proud because they view their understanding to worship on the first day of the week as being the proper day of worship? Well, yes, that's also, yes. Yeah, mainstay right there. They have, they have unity under the first day, Sunday. That's their right. unity. They can't unify in anything else but Sunday. It's the only thing on which they're unified. Yep. I would have to say that's true. But why will a bastard dwell in Ashdod? A bastard... Um... That is symbolic of no father, if I'm not mistaken, or out of wedlock. 
fathered out of wedlock. Okay. So there is no marriage. And we know that marriage institution is the one of the first things that he gave us. And that also can apply to marrying the church, marrying Christ. Okay, but in this in this situation with this word. It is to alienate a mongrel, one that is born of a Jewish father and a heathen mother. Ooh, I didn't know that. That sounds really cool. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I'm not necessarily cool, but you know, it, it, it matches. It makes much sense. Okay, so if we're looking at this, where where we are considering it the other place in the bible where this is found is deuteronomy 23 2 where it states a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the lord even to his 10th generation he shall not enter into the congregation of the lord So here is an example. Was the lineage of David through Boaz that considered as a bastard? Again, please. Okay. When we go back into the book of Ruth, we are given the example of a kinsman redeemer, right? Yes. Boaz marries Ruth, right? Right. And where was Ruth from? Oh, um, was she not a Moabitess? Yeah, a Moabite. That was it. Mm. So here she was now being married to a kinsman redeemer, a Jew, where she had come out of the heathen understandings. What was that question again, that last question there? Well, so my question is, is this not a working example of a bastard where Boaz of the children of Israel marries one that is not of the children of Israel, but of Moab? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's there. The symbology is there, definitely. Okay. Now, from the chat, the question is being asked or the comments being made, the offspring of Jewish men and heathen women in Ezra verse 10. So if we, if we contrast these two examples, the book of Ruth and Ezra 10, is there something for us to see? Because in Ezra 10, they are being called to put away their strange wives. Okay, in what Ruth, about, go ahead. Yeah, what about in Ruth chapter 4? So um, it says, um, verse 11, And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house <coughs> like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. 
and let thy house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So in this case, the, the offspring is, they ask a blessing upon the offspring of Ruth. Right. Is there a contrast, though, between what's happening here with Boaz and Ruth <clears throat> and what's occurring in Ezra 10? Well, yeah, because there, well, there's a different situation, yeah. One's coming from obedience and one from disobedience. Yes. One is walking by faith and the other is walking by sight. Could you agree with that? You could say that you could say at least one of them was walking by faith for sure. I mean, because if you're talking about Ruth, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. So Ruth um, listened to the woman that gave her the advice and told her what to do. And she, then Ruth practiced exactly what she preached to her. Well, okay. But here, here was Ruth as well. The initial advice given to her by her mother-in-law, Naomi, was to turn back and go to your people. On True. that, Ruth set that advice, advice aside. She chose to follow Naomi with the understanding that she sought that Naomi's people would be her people and Naomi's God would now be Ruth's God. Yes, I would have to say yes. So in this situation, the Moabitess is now walking by faith because she doesn't know if she's going to be accepted. She doesn't know if she's going to find a place within these people. She doesn't know if she's going to be able to survive. But she's casting her lot with her mother-in-law because of what she has seen within her mother-in-law's character. Agreeable. So in this case, is Ruth yeah. walking by faith? Yeah, and, and it's actually a prom promises in God's word. Because if we go back to Deuteronomy 23, 2, and it talks about uh, that the bastard would not enter into the congregation unto the 10th generation. Right? Right. And then in uh, the story of Esther, they're going to refer back to... Um, uh, well, it says even in verse 3, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their 10th generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Right? So in Esther, um, Esther, um, in Ruth uh, chapter 4, um, they're, they're going to refer to that. Right? So the the elders are going to do this is sort of the wedding blessing, I guess. Um, so they're going to refer back to the fact that Ruth is a Moabitess. And that's the result of and the Moabites come from Pharaohs and Tamar, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's is that the idea? It goes back to. That's the Moabites. Just a moment. So that's going to go back to Perez. And, and David's going to be the 10th generation from Perez. Mm. 
No, the Moabites. Where do they come from? They were they were one of the sons of Lot. Okay, but they're but but they're descent Pharez. Okay, so but Pharez is a Moabite or is tame. No, 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 no. So why why are they going back there? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. So are they are they just saying that, that that's just a bastard? The, the right child. because okay because remember you have the older daughter and you have the younger daughter of Lot. Okay, so and that's the, Mo the Moabites. Those those are the Moabites and the Ammonites. Okay, so then where do we get Pharez in this story, and Tamar? What would that have to do with with this? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Perez and and Tamar, okay, you do have a Jewish father and a heathen mother. Agreed. Okay. But but no one's a Moabite. But they're not a Moabite. Okay. Okay, that's what I was trying to figure out. So the Moabites are ones that have come because of incest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Moabites are Jewish father, Jewish mother, by incest. And the Moabites had been a great enemy of Israel, yeah. where with the children of Tamar, they were accepted within Israel. Yeah, but still, so Judah and Tamar, they produce Pharez. Correct. Okay. Pharez and his brother, right? Two children. Yeah, and what was the relationship between Tamar and and Judah then? That was her father-in-law, right? Correct. Father-in-law and daughter-in-law. And where did she come from? I don't know that we're told. Hmm. Okay. I mean, that's Genesis 41, isn't it? So anyway, we're going to have David is going to be the 10th generation, counting Pharez as the first generation. Okay. Right, because you're going to have... Um, Sorry, it's Genesis 38. In, in, in Ruth 4, verse 18 to 22... Right, so if you go back to Ruth. Um, it's going to give this genealogy. And now these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Aminadab, Aminadab begat Nashon, Nashon begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz begat Obed, Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. So that's 10 generations, including Pharaoh's and David's generation. Right. So, so is that why this is mentioned? Is this like a prophecy in Deuteronomy 23 too, dealing with uh, that this technically is, is a bastard, but it's a non-Jew marrying a Jew. Is it a prophecy or is it a symbol for us in some other manner? Well, yeah, well, that's, that's what I mean by a prophecy. I mean, it's, it's prophetic in its implications, that it's not, it's, it's not just randomly that there happens to be 10 generations from Pharaohs to David. Okay, so Iran says Judah's firstborn was from a Canaanite who was married to Tamar. So that would be, make Tamar a Canaanite then part. 
but no, that doesn't say anything about Tamar, though. It just says about... So, so we don't get where Tamar comes from. Right. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Okay. So as we continue through this, we are told, woe unto the inhabitants of the sea coast the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. So when we come down to this, for this area, this seacoast, we're told to look at Jeremiah 6, 4 and 15, 8. Prepare ye war against her. Arise, and let us go up at noon. Woe unto us, for the day goeth away, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. And we are to compare this with, their widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. I have brought upon them against the mother of the young men a spoiler at noonday. I have caused him to fall upon it suddenly and terrors upon the city. Why would they look to start a battle at noon? There is no surprise. There's no great advantage. They can see you coming. So what kind of symbol do we see here? Just like with this situation with the bastard that shall dwell in Ashdod, we are being shown that there is going to be a, a battle, a disagreement, a a heated argument. They're going to be able to see this coming. They know that this is going to come upon a situation until the end of this day of the Lord. Why is this important for us to know? I think this is giving us a preparation because we're going to have to understand how the day of the Lord is going to be seen by so many within the world. Right now, if we walk into any Adventist church with either of these charts, are we not going to be met with trite words that the church has set these aside? Are they not going to try to tell us that this is not the way we should study, rather than line upon line, rather than using Miller's rules, do they not wish to use other methods of biblical interpretation? Do they not try to keep their members at rest, asleep, with a peace and safety message? Yeah, seems to be. So is this not the same as the battle arise and let us go up at noon? Arise, let us go up 
as the day is long past, Now, in the last portions of this verse, woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Carathites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will destroy thee, I will even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. We're told to examine Ezekiel 25, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand upon the Philistines and I will cut off the Carathims and destroy the remnant of the seacoast. And then we return, we come to Joshua 13, 3. From Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanite, five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites, the Ashdodthites, the Eshkelonthites, the Gittites, the Ekronites, and the Aviites, Gaza, Ashdod, Eshkelon, Gittite, Ekronites, Aviites. There's a lot more than five here. In fact, there is six. Again, where is Gath? Why is Gath yet again not mentioned and hidden? These are some of the questions that come up in reading these. And the seacoast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon. In the houses of Ashkelon shall they lie down in the evening when Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. When the Lord their God shall visit them. Why is it important that we understand that the seacoast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds? The Philistines were a very warlike people. There are those that believe that they were mariners. Yet, we're being told that this seacoast will be the dwellings and cottages for shepherds. What symbol do we see with the shepherds? Is the, is the word being used here for shepherd that of one that would tend a flock, that would look after the sheep? That would have that would be what a shepherd is. Um, the Millerites never had a definition for shepherd, as far as when I say definition, a symbol for it. Okay. So that's you're saying I'm these are the, are the pastors. I'm asking if this is. Since, since this is going through with the destruction of the Philistines, 
we know that out of the water, that waters represent many peoples. Right? So if we have a sea coast here, then we have many waters. So we have dwellings and cottages for shepherds, those that would lead a flock, those that would give a true word of the Lord at this time. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon, shall they lie down in the evening. When the Lord their God shall visit them and shall turn away their captivity. Who is it where the Lord will turn away their captivity? Would this not well, be shepherd. the remnant? The remnant, yeah. So are we speaking here of the 144,000? Are we speaking about those that come out of Babylon? Yeah, it would, it would appear that way, yes. Is there any other symbol that we can, we can de derive from this? I'm not sure. I don't I see the water, and I, I know what that symbol is. I see the coast. And I see the um, Judah there. And defining who Judah is, we know that to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? And those that follow him. So, yeah, the symbology is all there. It's not really a stretch. So what, what do the houses of Ashkelon represent? Hmm. Well, if we remember that Ascalon refers to the fire of infamy or I shall be weighed. Okay. So are these that are weighed in the balance and not found wanting? Are these that pass through many, many tekel you farsen? Yeah, because the word there, Ascalon, comes from the word shekel. Right. Interesting. So, again, as we make this application back with the book of Daniel, we know those that were weighed in the balance and found wanting are those that are being led to destruction. Here we have shepherds <clears throat> and folds for flocks that are for the remnant of the house of Judah. They are not found wanting. They are whole. They have faith that God has been leading them. They have become righteous by their faith. And the Lord their God shall visit them. 
Can the Holy Spirit inhabit those that are not committed to God? I would say no. They're not committed to the relationship, then no. The Holy Spirit cannot dwell in a, in a divided house, right? Right. Okay. So is this not giving us an example of a house that is not divided? Because how can the Lord visit them and turn away their captivity? if the house is not fully committed to him. Look at the example of Abraham. Did God not visit Abraham? Yes. Okay. Abraham understood what it was to be in God's presence. Did Moses understand what it meant to be in God's presence? Uh, question again, please. Did Moses not understand what it meant to be in God's presence? Yes, well, yes he, he did. did. Okay. Did Elijah understand what it meant to be in God's presence? Um, well, yes. Is this not the lesson that we need for today, that we are in the presence of the Lord and we are not to have a divided loyalty, that our faith is to be placed completely upon the word of God, to understanding that he is going to do exactly as he has promised he would do. Well, yes, 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 and yes. If this is the case, then is this not a promise for the remnant of the house of Judah where the Lord, their God, will visit them and turn away their captivity, turn away their shame, make their slavery of no effect, that he is lifting them up. This is some of what I think is being shown in this portion of Zephaniah. It is the reverse because we have a curse being given in the earlier verses. We are being shown a blessing here. So we're, we're seeing a curse and a blessing, just as we have been addressing blessings and curses from Leviticus 25 and 26. So this could very easily be the outcome of a seven times. and an application in an example of exactly what we would see from the seven times. Now, there are several verses we need to go through here. I'm going to address a couple because our time is short. When we come down to this in Psalms 126, Psalms 126, verse 1. So we have 
a, a fractal representation of the 2520. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Who were those to whom God would send dreams? Did he not yeah, send Daniel? Daniel? Yeah. Did he did he not send a dream to Nebuchadnezzar? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Was not a dream given to Pharaoh that Joseph was able to interpret? And were we not told that your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams? Yes. Jeremiah 29, 14. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. There are many promises that are in this portion of the book of Jeremiah. Zephaniah 3 verse 20. And at that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather you, for I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth. When I turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. Now. When we return again next week. We're going to go through some of the other cross-reference verses from Zephaniah 2.6 and 2.7. That's where we will begin our study this next week. Any comments or thoughts at this time? Anything that you've seen that you may wish to bring out? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, thank you for these words of Zephaniah. Thank you for the examples, the symbols, and the discussion today. Direct us now through this day, through this Sabbath. Help us so that that which we do may bring glory unto you, or your character may be even more revealed. For those that travel, we ask for traveling mercies. As we attend and look at other portions of Scripture, Help us now to understand. Guide us, direct us, and be with us through this day. For this we thank you, and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.